Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to welcome and introduce to you the keynote speaker of uh, today's uh, Wrocław Global Forum, Dr. Witold Waszczykowski, Poland's Foreign Minister. Let's welcome Minister. Yeah. In this venue, my role is to introduce the speaker, uh, which is uh, always a challenging task if you have to introduce the Foreign Minister. People, people know him, people uh, know what he thinks, what um, his policy is. So let me start from the um, quote from the first Secretary General of NATO, who said that NATO um, is for peace by collective security. Now we are ahead of uh, NATO Warsaw Summit. We have 30 days or so to this um, event. And if we think about peace and collective security, uh, both terms matter a lot. We could sustain peace by acting together, by defending peace together. But collectivity means also leadership, needs leadership. Uh, Minister Waszczykowski has been traveling around the world repeating few terms. Presence, presence, presence. Deterrence, deterrence, deterrence. And defense, defense, defense. NATO needs all of them right now and, the, and it's Eastern Slang. And it is a leadership we need. Uh, a journalist I met a, f uh, a few weeks ago said about Minister Waszczykowski, Mr. Presence. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome at this stage Minister Witold Waszczykowski, the leader of the collective effort to preserve peace in Europe. Witold, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Director. I hope I will deliver just like uh, NATO Summit will supposed to deliver. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first let me thank organizers for having me at uh, uh, Wroclaw Global Forum. I have to admit that I'm uh, for the very first time uh, attending this uh, this venue here. Uh, the Global Forum, which has established itself as Europe's leading venue for discussing global developments. Wroclaw is not only the European capital of culture today, but for the for these two uh, days has become the capital of uh, transatlantic uh, politics as well. I'm particularly satisfied that the Polish Institute of International Affairs, a think tank which is very closely affiliated with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, is a co-organizer of this event. I'm also happy that we have our American friends from the Atlantic Council aboard, as this uh, bolstered our transatlantic link, which is one of the foundations of the Polish foreign policy. The organizers rightly note that uh, the Wroclaw Global Forum is an important distributor of ideas. In times of crisis, we are in need of a bold, stimulating, and novel thinking. In the current geopolitical setting, we should ask tough questions and be ready to give straightforward and realistic answers. 
And my, on my short uh, flight from, from Warsaw this, this morning, this afternoon, I had the chance to, to browse the program, trying to find out what the leading idea of the conference, what's the light motive of this, this year forum is. And uh, I was not surprised uh, by, one by one word, or actually acronym, which dominates the agenda, and this is NATO. NATO is a key word, NATO is a key uh, name of this, uh, and term of this uh, deliberation today. NATO is a leitmotiv of today. Challenges emanating from our eastern and southern neighborhood directly threaten our security, stability, and prosperity. And NATO should have an adequate response to counter these challenges. Ahead of the July Warsaw NATO summit, let me share with you the Polish thinking how we take the challenges that we are facing. The Polish perspective on how the alliance should adopt to the current security environment. And let me try to, to answer what is really at stake. I would like to structure my presentation into three ideas. The context, the content, and the consequences of the uh, upcoming summit. Mm. Let me start with the context. Uh, today, our neighborhood is a challenge. And there are two primary sources of this insecurity that we are facing. Practically all of Europe's southern neighborhood has become an area of growing turmoil and multiple threats, both for the region itself and ever more directly for Europe. Conflicts uh, have spread from North Africa shores and the Mediterranean to Sahel and even to Sub-Saharan sub Africa. The Middle East area of instability has been extended even farther to the east, encompassing countries like Afghanistan and Northwest Pakistan. Turkey, our important member of a transatlantic community, is directly exposed to this risk generated by the Syrian war, where local, regional, and global actors are involved. Continuing and widespread violence is dis disrupting these existing state structures. As uh, results, we have today on our southern doorstep a growing number of failed or near failed states with non-state actors such as, such as Daesh and multiple other terrorist organizations controlling vast territories. Conflicts uh, produce tremendous humanitarian consequences and generate a huge migration pressure on Europe. Considerable numbers of foreign fighters who join the ranks of Daesh increase the probability of ever greater spillover of violence. Terrorist attacks perpetrated in Europe has shown that no country, no country should feel immune to risk that emanate from the South and pose a long-term threat to the well-being of Europeans. Failed states also provide transit routes for criminal networks, trafficking not only people, but also drugs and weapons. Our southern neighborhood has thus become a source of instability, instability which is a concern for the whole transatlantic community. On the other side of Europe, on the eastern flank, we have Russia with, with its aggressive and revisionist posture. Russia which undermines the sovereignty of states. Russia which poses a threat to the West as a whole, as it does not only challenge the territorial integrity, but also the political unity of the transatlantic community. Russia which challenges the order, 
based on inter international principles which have guided international politics since the end of the Cold War or even before. Terms like uh, zero-sum game, military force, have become keywords in Russian foreign policy, in Russian foreign policy, political language. What we see today is, in fact, Russia returning to some, some, some sort of a Cold War mentality. Many times we have been hearing that this policy is uh, actually reaction to the West aggressive policy, infringing on Russia's core strategic interests. Thus, Russia simply responding to NATO's eastern expansion. Let me debunk this myth. For years, Russia has been treated as an equal partner. For years, we are trying to create even privileged relationship with Russia by European Union and NATO. NATO has been trying to accommodate Russian concerns, among others by setting up the NATO-Russia Council, which was supposed to bring in a new quality into our relations. The discussion around Ukraine's and Georgia's NATO membership perspective was to a large extent shaped by Russia's concerns. What has Russia offered us in return? Let's set the fact straight. 2007, Munich conference, similar conference like this, Munich Security Conference. President Putin's speech, which thrilled many and should already then be a wake-up call for all of us. 2008, Russia's military intervention in Georgia. 2009, Zapad, the West, military exercise with a scenario envisaging a NATO attack on Belarus. An 80% increase in military spending since 2007. Russian national security strategy, all in all, is depressing read. I could probably spare all my time telling you about Russia's conduct, which, euphemistically speaking, is not a friendly one. This is Russia today. Yet we do acknowledge the need for keeping channels, channels of communication with our eastern neighbor open. Dialogue, although should not be seen as a policy in itself, and dialogue should be pursued based on a sound assessment of Russia's posture. Otherwise, we could end up in a divisive discussion. We cannot allow that to happen. Ladies and gentlemen, against this backdrop, we have our expectations toward the summit. Hence, we'll come the next C, content. I mentioned two major flashpoints. It's not secret that the perception of threats and the hierarchy differs among NATO member states. This should not come as a surprise for an alliance of 28 state, states, soon to be 29 states, 29 states, with uh, different historical experiences, geographies, very often different geopolitics. But in order to deliver, NATO has to manage situation on both flanks, eastern and southern. We simply must match appropriate defense and deterrence measures with the character of threats. Yet one thing is uh, clear for us. Nobody should question the principle according to which all member states across the entire territory of the Alliance should be given an equal security status. Just a few days ago, I was happy to hear Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, prize Poland for its contribution to the transatlantic security. He said that Poland has, and I quote, evolved from a new ally into a leading ally, end of the quotation. Indeed, Poland has demonstrated its credibility 
as a reliable member of NATO and the Western community. We have brought our military spending up to 2% of GDP. Not many other NATO members fulfill this pledge. Yet the division, the division between the so-called old and the new member states after nearly 20 years still stands. That's why I'm afraid. We are well aware of the fact that our own military capabilities will not be enough, will not be enough to counter external threats. And that is why we would like to see NATO beef up, beef up its physical presence on the eastern flank, providing real security guarantees to all its members. Only a substantial investment in infrastructure, the stationing, deployment of NATO troops on the ground can give Poland and its neighbors, of course, the security we need, and thus level, equal, the unequal status. This is why our primary objective is to have a multinational forward presence of all allied forces in Poland and in the Baltic states. Let's be clear, NATO should go in area or will be in trouble. That's a quotation of one American expert. Maybe he's here at the, at the conference. Today, NATO key, key's word should be deterrence, as it's mentioned by the director, seen not, not, seen not as an offensive measure, but rather as the most effective and, in, and in fact, the only instrument of peace building. We do not want to wage a war against anyone, but to avoid a war, avoid a war scenario, we must show that we are very well prepared and determined to defend our territory and values we share. Appeasement never works. If it's not sure, it's not supported by military strength. This has, this has been, as well, perfectly now, proven by history. Much has been decided and done already, but uh, a lot more is needed. The Warsaw Summit will be a watershed in NATO's post-Cold War history. But it's just the beginning. We need a permanent strategic adaptation of the alliance. There are some other points of Warsaw Summit agenda. Enlargement process is not finished yet. We welcome the decision on Montenegro's accession. By the way, I had the chance to, a few days ago to visit Montenegro and con congratulate them, wise decision. But it's not the last candidate lining up for the membership. We have Macedonia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Georgia. We cannot allow the third country to have a say on the future of the alliance. Stability and the security of the West is not possible without a peaceful, stable, and secure neighborhood. This is why it's crucial that we deepen our partnership with like-minded minded countries in frame of the cooperative security approach. Our closest partners, Finland and Sweden, deserve special attention. Strengthening the resilience of Ukraine and Georgia to internal and external threats should also be among our objectives. We would like, or we have to, deepen our cooperation also with remote countries like Jordan. Finally, the last C, the consequences. What is at stake at Warsaw Summit? Very briefly, it's a preservation of the alliance unity. Unity which is vital to maintaining a credible defense and deterrence posture. Thus, we cannot let differences prevail over common purpose. The, the principle or the mentioned by previous colleagues of 28 for 28 should become NATO's axiom. 
The presence of troops from different NATO countries should become a symbol of the Alliance's determination to defend the eastern flank, a symbol of renewed solidarity, a symbol of the West's strength and power. It should also be a symbol of the West's stability and ability to adjust itself to dynamically changing circumstances, both political and military. Throughout its history, the Alliance proved to have a robust, but also a flexible institutional structure, underpinned by common values of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law, it has always been able to effectively address challenges at hand. Despite differences regarding particular courses of action, which are natural in any organization with so many member states, its ability to act reminded strong and its mission coherent. It allowed NATO to dramatic, dramatically expand the area of trans transatlantic stability, not by force, but by power of its democratic vision and its power to attract new members. It became a synonym of a safe harbor, sometimes safe heaven. In the current demanding geopolitical situation and rising in instability, it is crucial that NATO maintains the reputation of its power. We must carefully analyze today's political environment and find the right answers. If in, the conduct, if the, in conducting our deliberations, we are guided by common purpose, which is to provide security for our democracies, I strongly believe we will be able to come up with effective responses, but also send the right signals to the outside world. If, on the other hand, we allow short-term interest to get in the way, if we show doubt and disunity, will not only deteriorate the long-term security of all allies, but also encourage those who wish to perceive NATO as an enemy to continue the disruptive policies unabated. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for sharing with us uh, your thoughts and your policy. Ladies and gentlemen, now, I would like to uh, um, invite you for the coffee break. And in 20 minutes, we'll uh, meet again here in this, in this venue, and we'll discuss the issues concerning Ukraine, Russia, and Eastern uh, neighborhood. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>